went into the finals, semifinals with 21, and then a different 21 the second <laughs> night. <laughs> so if this were a baseball team, I guess you would say that the bench is very deep. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so tonight we have uh, gathered everybody that we can muster to sure. come here, and uh, we're going to perform a piece for you called My Girls, and it is by a female composer named Gwyneth Walker. Congratulations and thank you all. <coughs> what a way to start. Uh, any questions about the agenda or any additions anybody wants to suggest? Or? Okay. Um, 
Oh, yes, yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to. Hey, Zoe. Hi. Uh, I'd like to welcome Michael D. Chair as a new member of the Regional School Committee from Shutesbury. Welcome, Michael. Thank you. Michael. Thank you. Um, okay, uh, approval of minutes of April 24th. Any comments on those? So moved. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Opposed? Okay, great. I'll stay. <coughs> yeah. Um, announcements and public comment. Anyone wishing to make a public comment uh, could please come forward and state their name and try to keep it to three minutes and just a reminder of the committee that we don't respond to public comments. Can I see hands of uh, Melissa? Mm -hmm. Good evening. Um, that was pretty amazing. <laughs> it's, like, it's like surrounded by sound. Um, so I'm here to talk with you tonight. I did try to email you um, our, our statement before and actually had an opportunity to email with um, Maria and um, Joanne Smith too and heard back a little bit on this so I'll read to you what I prepared and then I've, I've edited a few things and just added a few comments as well um, so for some of you that don't don't know me yet um, welcome I'm the co-president for the Special Education Parent Advisory Council um, and I'm here tonight to address recent concerns brought to me by several parents <coughs> of the uh, special education students at the in the Ames program that's currently housed at Wildwood Elementary School. Um, some of you might be knowledgeable about the program and others might uh, not. So I'm, I've taken the description from the site, from the Amherst website to read to you so you'll know a little bit about what the program is. Um, so the Academic Individualized Mainstream Support Program is a specialized program for students who have high functioning autism spectrum disorder or other neurological conditions with pragmatic language, executive functioning, um, socialization, and sensory regulation difficulties. These programs offer individualized, comprehensive, and intensive intervention to address these areas. And the district currently has the Ames program at Wildwood and um, Amherst Regional Middle School and the Regional High School. So our concern here is with the recent decision to move the Ames program from Wildwood to Fort River. And so I'll read to you um, a statement that was prepared by, um, by these parents and by several groups of parents. Um, these students are a vulnerable population and should be treated with equal respect as other students in the district. Um, in April, a notification was issued to these parents of these students that the program will be moved to Fort River and this decision was made without consultation with the children's families, CPAC, or to the best of our knowledge, the school committee. Uh, since forwarding this to Maria today, I did hear, like I mentioned, from um, Joanne Smith and also the program coordinator um, for Ames, and both indicated that they provided outreach to the families directly and worked on a case-by-case -case, uh, basis with these families. Um, but despite this, there's still some concerns that are coming up. So without the opportunity to discuss this um, at a community level, the district has provided a solution to the overcrowded schools resulting from the redistricting in part by moving this program out of their present environment school into another. And that's where we step in because our concern is for this special population. Children in this program with the autism spectrum disorder struggle in social relationships, transitions, and academic performance. On the higher range of, of the autism spectrum currently served at Ames, they are more likely than their peers to be socially isolated, socially ostracized, and find it difficult to make new friends. For our children on the spectrum served at Ames, the risks are greater and may result with a greater incidence of depression or attempted suicide as a result of these social challenges. Um, a mid-elementary school move is challenging for all children and reduces academic, social, and mental health outcomes. Children in the Ames program at Wildwood have struggled hard to find a sense of security and community at Wildwood, and they're now being told that they're, aside from their difference, that they must now move. For these children with this disability, who may have it, and, and it might be subtle for them, um, the move taken a year, taken in a year and no one else is moving, discloses their disability without their consent. And it's disconcerting that the program based on inclusion would do so clearly to a segment of these children. In addition, Fort River is home to building blocks program for children with additional struggles. And this has raised another set of concerns. Some parents of children with these needs are worried that their classroom teachers will be overwhelmed by the inclusion of the two programs. 
As recent school committee's decisions have led to overcrowding at Wildwood, we would ask that, plea, that you please look very closely at the decision and reconsider a move that has immense potential to impact our vulnerable student population. So I'd also like to point out two things um, in closing, that this is posted on our blog and we welcome comment and public comment on it, and we would really appreciate feedback from all. Um, and again, I'll mention that they have reached out and indicated the uh, Joanne Smith and um, both and Brent Nielsen, the program coordinator, that they're also available for additional comments and welcome feedback. Um, and lastly, CPAC would ask that an open meeting uh, with a neutral moderator be offered to the parents as a group, uh, potentially so that they can express their feelings in a neutral environment. And, um, and I think that would be a good opportunity for these parents to be able to voice their concerns outside of an IEP meeting where they might be experiencing stressors um, and that type of thing. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Melissa. Vince? Vince O'Connor, um, Amherst, and uh, one I just in reference to the previous comments as a sibling of three, um, two brothers and a sister who had special needs issues and, and still do. Um, I would hope that the school committee would schedule a discussion on this matter prior to taking off for the summer so that you could have some input into the decision. Um, and uh, decide whether this is a uh, this is a move that you would approve of um, as a school committee. Um, but my my concern and and it used to have a different process that that people could not speak of a matter that was on your agenda at the open session and would have to wait and for that agenda item to come up and then would be recognized after the administrators and the school committee. Um, have had a chance to speak, and uh, right now, of course, that um, you have a policy that's different from that, and I would ask you to reconsider that. But with respect to an item on your agenda tonight, which is the later start, um, I would just like to bring to the school committee's attention a matter uh, involving athletics. When I, uh, when the students who I've been involved with for the last six years at the regional school level three of whom are graduating this year, first came into the school uh, district, particularly into the high school. There was a policy of handing out academic achievement awards for students who had maintained a B average or higher by the athletic director, who used to review the transcripts of all, of all students. And who, ha having done this, uh, you know, going through a year of this with the former athletic director, she said that um, from her evaluation of, of transcripts to, to be able to make these awards, which are sponsored by the Massachusetts Interscholastic uh, Athletic Association, um, it was her view that, um, that the ath student athletes at Amherst Regional were achieving a grade point averages one quarter to one half by the trimester, one quarter to one half above that of the, of the other students in Amherst Regional. Um, and so given that a later start might have a significant impact <coughs> on a matter that I believe um, where there is a differential in academic achievement, simply because as I've observed, uh, students who, who involve themselves in athletics have to acquire the self-discipline and time management and all the other skills that are necessary to to perform in athletics as well as keep up with homework and do other and fulfill other responsibilities that they have both f perhaps for work and at home. So um, I think that uh, that would be, I think, an important issue to resolve. I know that you have computerized records and I, I certainly would hope that um, one of the things that the committee could consider before it makes a decision is um, is the records of, of a, at least a few years of trimester by trimester records showing the, uh, 
what the grade point averages are of those who, who participate in, in athletics in a given trimester and those um, who do not. Um, and if you determine that there is a significant difference, uh, then I think you may want to think about, think differently about this later start issue. Uh, the other thing is that I, I, in terms of health issues, you, 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 you manage a school district that, or make policy for a school district that has one mandatory physical education class for each student for four years. Not per trimester per year, but one for every four years. You come here, you take one when you're a ninth grader, and that is it. You might, there are some electives, but that's it. And I think that if you we're talking about health, mental acuity, um, long long term, lifetime stuff, uh, I think that that the, the the school committee needs to focus on how to involve more students in physical activity, not necessarily in interscholastic athletics, but in physical activity because I think there are significant lifetime and, and short-term benefits to that. Anyway, thank you very much. Thanks, Vince. Right. Anyone else? Oh. This is um, really quick. Um, my name's Birdie, I'm from Amherst. Um, I have a daughter who had a situation in a classroom where the teacher has lost his job I don't want to just talk about Amherst, but I'm concerned about district-wide um, professional development that is available for general ed teachers um, for special ed needs with management issues, classroom management, and discipline. Okay. So I don't know if there's a place that I can go to find out what you offer for teachers or what are the regulations for that? Or? You can come see me. Okay. Great. Yeah, please. Please do. Okay, um, yes, yes, I will come. Um, first of all, um, I'd like to commend Mark Jackson and um, his administration crew and teacher crew who made a, an incredibly well-informed um, presentation to the recreation team on Sunday afternoon. I would also request of Mark that he convey at least my appreciation and gratitude to the four students who, um, who, who presented as well. I think it's really important that we publicly recognize their poise, their self-confidence, and their eloquence in expressing their um, experiences here at the high school. If you could do that, Mark, I think we'd probably all appreciate that. Mm -hmm. um, secondly, and I'll try to make this very, very quick, there was an article in the New York Times yesterday regarding uh, Pearson's involvement, Pearson's an educational, uh, international educational company, um, with um, bringing about a new teacher licensure um, test. Um, I had an email exchange with a professor at UMass School of Education who was involved, who was mentioned in the article, and who um, is involved in this debate, ongoing conflict with Pearson. Uh, it's a very complicated situation. I would encourage you to see if you can find the article in yesterday's New York Times. The point that I bring, the reason why I'm bringing it up tonight is that um, Pearson um, made a request to videotape um, student teachers here at the high school. And um, I, my understanding that um, they were refused. Mm -hmm. And I just simply want to know if there's any way that the school committee can support the administration's position on that, either mm -hmm. through a resolution, through a reexamination of our policy, uh, or whatever the administration thinks appropriate. Um, Pearson is working very hard to, um, they were not, they're a profit, for profit company. They're, they're working very hard, in my opinion to what I would call commodify public education. Uh, they're charging these student teachers uh, $300 a whack just to take the test. So if you don't pass it, it's, six, it's $300 every time you take it. And I just think that that's um, the wrong way to go. I applaud the administration for not allowing them to come in, um, but I'm not sure if that's gonna be able to stick and if there's anything we can mm -hmm. do, I'd like to at least have that conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? Okay, moving along to superintendent's update. So we're gonna, um, we have <laughs> two wonderful events with students tonight. So I'm gonna ask Jeff's daughter to come up right away with his students um, to talk a little bit about 
um, the project, uh, the memory project, or project memory that they've been involved with. And I know they're going to show us something here, too. Yeah. So thank you for coming, Jeff. Thank you. I'd like to thank Maria for inviting me and Kim mm -hmm. Stender for uh, facilitating that. Uh, so I'd rather the students talk. Yes. There's three here. Uh, we had 17. 16, thanks, sir. <laughs> 16 students total involved in this, so um, they're very busy people, and we didn't want to uh, bring out 16 for you, but um, their names will be part of this um, PowerPoint projection that I'll run uh, in a moment. So last spring, Sarah Waldman, uh, who's here tonight, uh, came to me and brought to my attention the existence of this charitable group, The Memory Project, which is run out of Wisconsin by a man named Ben Schumacher, and, uh, and told me all about it, and so, and asked if we could start a club, and uh, I had a pretty full plate, so I, I said, well, I'll look into it, and then after looking into it, I really couldn't say no, so, <laughs> and you'll see why in a second, because I think it's just a fantastic idea that, again, this, um, this guy in Wisconsin started up, and so uh, we gathered in the fall, and uh, these 16 students made a huge commitment and really spent tons of time doing their very best to create portraits for uh, orphans uh, in the developing world, and so we were assigned certain pictures uh, mailed to us from Wisconsin. There was fundraising involved. We did amazing bake sales uh, to pay our to pay our to get the pictures delivered in in the hands of the the subjects and I guess just to very briefly generalize what the idea behind the project is is creating a portrait so that an uh, a child can have a picture of themselves as, as as a youth these aren't kids with loads of digital pictures of themselves so that when they age uh, they they have this painted portrait which uh, you know still has kind of a value greater than uh, a photograph in, in many cultures and situations. So I know they're, they're really prized. And um, these guys are going to talk about what the experience was like a little bit. Yeah? Okay. Hi, I'm Sarah Waltman. I'm a junior. Um, so for me, I uh, learned about this project from uh, my school uh, in Harvard, Massachusetts. I moved here at the beginning of my sophomore year. Um, and I had seen other students participate. And, you know, all of them were really, really attached to these kids, which they had never met before. Mm -hmm. And I didn't quite understand that. So that was one of the reasons why I really wanted to start it. And after going through this experience, it's been absolutely incredible. Um, you'll see the photos up on the projection, but just really quickly, um, this is my little girl, Jessica. Mm. Um, this is the portrait that I painted of her. Mm. Oh. Um, and <laughs> this is her reaction photo. And, um, you know, anytime I look at it, I just get so happy <laughs> mm -hmm. because, you know, I spent these hours and hours on this portrait and, you know, suddenly you see her face that, you know, this is hers and this is, mm. it, it was all worth it um, because this little girl now has something that has such meaning to her and she has a memory that will last her a lifetime. Um, so for me, it's just been, um, you know, something really priceless. Mm. Hi, my name is May Refson. Uh, I learned about the Memory Project from Sarah Waldman. I'm also a junior. Um, well, I think coming into the project, I didn't really understand what it was. And then having, after a while, I kind of really got the got to know my kid, like what Sarah had been saying. And I think it's very hard to have a very like touching experience in your life. Mm. Like those don't really come that often. I think a kid getting a portrait of themselves painted is like one of those moments mm -hmm. that like you don't really come by often. So I think that was really a really great experience and I think it was also really nice for me to be able to know that I made a difference in a child's life and stuff rather than just kind of sitting around and um, overall just like a really good learning experience for me and um, my girl was Michelle. That's great. And this was my portrait. Mm. So, um, yeah, uh, <laughs> I think I'll definitely be doing it next year if we do it again um, because it was really fun for me and it was nice to come after school and do it every day. So, thanks. Thank you. Hello, my name is Zue. 
um, the way Adams. And um, I'm also a junior, and I heard it from Sarah Waldman again. Um, and my girl was um, Valentina. And um, the first time I like saw her, oh my gosh, I just like. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. There we go. Okay. Um, this is my first time doing this, so. Um, <laughs> You're doing fine. So um, I just like fell in love with her, and um, for me. Um, the fact that she was an orphan, um, because I'm adopted also, I think it was really important um, and like made me kind of reflect on like um, what it would have been, been like to have a, a photo and a like portrait made from a teenager who um, who actually took the time to like paint paint me. I don't know. I just think that's really really like I don't know life change, I guess. Um, and I think um, I don't know. I think it's really cool that like one photo has so much power and I think that a lot of the people I know at least, um, they like just take photos and photos and photos and I think it kind of like ruins the, the power and beauty of it I guess. Um, and just like, just by learning like how to do these, these um, just like painting them I guess, because um, I'd never done this before either. Um, I guess I was, I just learned so much. Um, I don't really know. I think it's also really good for them to realize that um, that they have like um, I don't know, worth, that they, they're they worth something, you know, mm -hmm. that they have people that d really do care about them. So it was a really amazing experience. Yeah. Thank wow. you. Okay, so I just want uh, to, yeah. Mike, we'll see if Jerry takes the mask to work from anywhere. Yes. Magic. Okay. <laughs> All right, that'll work. Um, so if you could, uh, it's on the TV as well as the screen here. I just want to make sure you could see all the work that all the students did. So the names of the student is uh, there, Zoe Tesler. Um, and you can see these were the portraits that were delivered in March. So we'll just go through them. Uh, kids learned a lot about painting, as Zoe can tell you, um, how many hours and hours and hours of doing a realistic portrait with acrylic on paper. Um, they do many, many portraits every year, so uh, we are going to keep the club going, and it could be any country in the world, really, is um, uh, where where the memory project goes. So, There's the ways, yeah. <laughs> Maze. De definitely captured the hair in that one. <laughs> The students also wrote uh, letters that talked about what it was like to look at the picture uh, for all this time. So it was really a great experience, I know, for, for all of them. They, uh, when, when we got the pictures and I showed them this very, they, ha they hadn't seen the pictures yet and they all saw it. We had a lot of tears and stuff, so it was it was pretty moving experience. I think that's it. Cool. So thanks again for inviting me. Can I take a little attitude? Yes. So I just, I want to use Jeff's work with the Memory Project to make a larger statement about our art department. Mm -hmm. So the Memory Project took place, as was noted, outside of school. Mm -hmm. And so the other, the pattern to the art department is that the other kinds of projects that complement Jeff's work are uh, the empty bowls we made, mm -hmm. the art department made, the ceramics department made a hundred e empty bowls to participate in the survival center's yeah. um, fundraiser in January. And the third thing I would note is that we're in our fourth year for the end of the year program. Yeah, ARTHS. Okay, so, the, so this is the fourth year in a row at the mm -hmm. Nate Cole Center yeah. Yeah. on Main Street on their own time after school. They do an end of the year culminating art project, which if you haven't seen, it's a, it's a yeah. don't yeah. miss. Yeah. Yeah kind of thing. And it goes to the testimony, it, it testifies to the depth mm -hmm. of their commitment to cultivating the artists in the building. And it's all complementary of the, the in-school work. So Jeff is not alone in his work. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thank you.
Can I just say one thing? Um, this is the first time I've been brought to the verge of tears mm -hmm. for good reasons in a school committee. <laughs> so I, I really want to thank you. I want to thank Sarah for bringing it to our yes. school, and I want to thank Jeff for taking mm -hmm. it on, given I know how much teachers take on, and I want to thank May and Zoe for coming and sharing it with us. It's really beautiful work. All of you are very talented, too. Really? Mm -hmm. <laughs> So now I have to follow this. <laughs> it was spectacular. And, and it's nice to remind us, again, I know it, it takes some time from our meeting to have students come, but it really reminds us of why we're here. So I'd love to get back to having more student presence. Zoe is always here with us, which we greatly appreciate. Um, but have people come and talk about what you're doing in the schools is really meaningful. No pressure. <laughs> yeah. So I, you know, I'm I'm going to just be very brief because people can read this and I can go online. I just I did want to mention that uh, we mentioned I think at our last meeting that we have an Amherst College intern for the summer who's working with us 30 hours. We're also very fortunate that Dr. Carol Souls from UMass Civic Engagement Service Learning has secured a VISTA intern for me, for us as well for the months of July and August. So again, the projects that we have going on in our schools and our central office, they're going to help us with. So we thank our partners for really um, stepping up and supporting us. I also just briefly wanted to mention, um, we're really happy to announce that we have, and this is the old one, but the new alumni directory will be coming out in July. Kim Stender has been doing a substantial amount of work to um, work with the organization that updates this for us free of charge. Um, we have a number of alumni who've responded to update their information and over 700 purchases of this book already happening. And what this will do is it's going to kick off for us um, an alumni giving campaign. We're partnering with Amherst Education Foundation and we plan to kick off in the fall an alumni giving with a music and art um, opportunity for our community to come together, a free experience for people to come in and hear some performances which we are in the uh, beginning of planning. Um, so we, we're going to kick off our year of giving um, from our alumni and thank them for giving back to our schools. So we'll, more to come on that, but I just want to give you a little a brief update. Um, again, I just want to recognize that the high school is um, want to recognize them for their performing random acts of kindness and contributing to the positive <coughs> school climate. This is, I think, the third year of this being acknowledged in the schools where um, people are acknowledged for doing positive, um, positive contributions to the school and to each other. And then, um, I guess this random acts of kindness, there's a recognition grant. So when people are nominated, they're able to um, be recognized through this grant. And I don't know exactly what they get at the end of this grant, but I'm sure it is something spectacular from the raffle. So we thank them for um, their efforts. Uh, also, the Ultimate Frisbee, which I'm sure lots of people saw all weekend long, was packed here. Um, we have three students who are, have been chosen to represent the United States in the national team, and they're going to be going to Dublin, Ireland in August, which is impressive. And we have Zoe Friedman Coleman, Danny Ahn, and Angela Zhu, I believe. Um, and we congratulate them on this honor. Um, so Kip already mentioned NEASC, so again, I thank people who were able to come, and we're still in it. I think we have one more day of our visiting team, and we'll look forward to hearing some feedback about our high school um, shortly. Um, I'm going to just go down to, there are a couple other things that I will just mention. Charlotte's Web at the middle school was spectacular, and I want to uh, personally well, um, thank Sarah Wilson, who I think single-handedly pulled this off, and I don't know how you do that. Um, with a bunch of spectacularly enthusiastic middle schoolers, but she did, and it was an impressive um, event. Um, and also want to mention that um, we had some middle school students who participated in a Kid Wind Challenge at the Science and Sustainability Festival that um, happened at GCC. Um, and Peter Hudlicka and Michael Kamlars, I believe, um, created a science project which was featured um, and it was a mini green stream RV bus powered by hydrogen fuel cell, solar power and recycled rainwater. So again, a huge acknowledgement of our amazing kids and our amazing, amazing students and um, at that moment I will stop talking about this so we can move on. So great updates today. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> Let's move on to the fiscal year 12 third quarter budget update.
thought it'd be great to move this up in the agenda, but now I'm not so sure. <laughs> it's tough to follow along. I know. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, does everybody have a copy? Do we need a copy? Um, so I'm assuming you all read this interesting document, um, so I'm not going to belabor it. Uh, essentially, we're right on target. We're pretty much where we said we were. It's the last quarter report. We are still looking at about a $350,000 plus uh, move into E&D, which we've been planning for since December. I think the first quarter report we talked about that. Um, so we are right on track. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them, but otherwise, I guess we won't belabor it. There's no drama here. Okay. No okay. questions. That's just how you like it. <laughs> um, can I jump in again? And I apologize. I did announce this la at our last meeting, but there's a new member this time, so I wanted to make sure I just say again, our first annual African American Achievement Night is this Friday, May 11th, high school auditorium, 630 to 830. Students will be acknowledged for their achievements in a wide range of areas, academics, athletics, ex extracurricular community outreach. So members of the, the school committee are invited to attend. And then we also have our annual Latino Achievement Night, which is Friday, May 18th, and that's in the middle school auditorium. Again, 6.30 to 8.30. These are spectacular. Latino Achievement Night's been a spectacular event, and I can imagine the first annual um, African American Achievement Night will be as well. So please attend if you can. Um, so I didn't want to miss that point again. Thank you. Okay, uh, moving on to later start time follow-up. Okay. So um, this was really just an opportunity for, I think, people to hear a bit of follow-up. There were some questions that were posed, which we sent the information to you, and I'd be happy to reference any of that. We have Mike is here again. We have Rich here and uh, Mark here if there are specific questions or follow-up. I know, Michael, you've been following this, so you're um, in the conversations, I think, solidly enough. Mm -hmm. um, but we also wanted to have enough opportunity for community members to send information to school committee if, if necessary. So I think this is your conversation to be had, unless there are specific things you'd like me to um, reference. Because again, I, I think we're hoping for a vote in two weeks, which is the 22nd. 22nd. Debbie. All right, I have questions. Um, th thanks for pulling this additional information together. So my questions are, are um, kind of along the lines of uh, what Vince was talking about, the implications for athletics. And you know, I know we're by shifting the start time, we hopefully be greatly reducing the stress on kids early on the on in the day. But you know, the goal is really to kind of improve all student outcomes and if we're just shifting it to later on in the night I'm not sure whether we're really accomplishing that so I really want to get some details on what that later in the day looks like for our students who are also athletes which I understand is about a third of our students so I'm curious um, so it looks like it looks to me if we are following kind of the current way we do our schedule that athletic practices would start at 430 and so my questions are is that true that athletic practices would start at 430 if so what time would they end is there any discussion about putting a cap on the time that uh, coaches are allowed for practice to get uh, kids home earlier um, and if we, if in fact those times are correct, what are going to be the times for games, meets, matches, whether they're home or away? And if the home um, matches are significantly later than they are now, have the other ADs within the league been talked to? Has this, have we come to agreement on this? Or is the idea that they, in fact, even home ones would be earlier, as well as away ones, so kids would be released from school earlier for any competition. So I think those were my, my main questions. And I, I will say, I, um, it was interesting, in, in the material, I looked at all the information on the website for the Sharon School. They, mm -hmm. 
they shifted to a later start time. It was a, a small shift. Right. It was like less than half an hour. Mm -hmm. So they now start at 8.05. But they really did a pretty phenomenal job and really laid out like all the details, which I, I think is what you're hoping to do mm -hmm. in this coming year, to give all those details to us. But I'm kind of struggling with what I'm voting on if I don't actually know those details ahead of time. That's So mm -hmm. that those are the kinds of questions I have. Oh, the other questions, morning. When will the school open? When will the library open? Um, when will, you know, people be here to, to provide support to students? Those kinds of questions. Does anyone want to tackle anything now? Or are we writing? <laughs> so, um, I guess Shortly after we met last time, uh, Debbie sent out a request for the Westmoreland uh, a request for information that seemed to address Debbie Gould, your lead question. And I responded uh, in a way that kept the same math in place. Because one thing I would be unwilling to do is if we did this, I wouldn't want to stipulate that somehow the kinds of after-school supports that are both contractual and then the other things that we, that we, that we do that would somehow be sacrificed. Mm -hmm. So let me just re yeah. review that publicly. So currently teachers contractually are in their classrooms 40 minutes past dismissal. So that's 2.20 to 4 o'clock. So if we dismissed at 3.15 under, under, the, under the flip and move, I would still want to insist that Teachers are in their classrooms for four, for 40 minutes, right? So we're to 504. And then, as it currently exists in the high school, when kids need to dress in order to compete for practice for a game, there's another 15 minutes tacked on before a kid can be expected to be on the field, right? So now we're at 410 as the earliest that, uh, that a practice could begin. So that's under the current model. If we just rotated everything forward and kept the same, the same length, practice begins at 4.10. So during the winter when we're all inside, light comes from here. In the fall, when it's soccer and field hockey and football and we're all outside and we get on in, into, the, into the later fall and light, the, light diminishes, mm -hmm. that's a challenge we, we need to figure out. So the other thing that's come on, so I just, I just want to stipulate that, that I can't imagine compromising on, on that kind of basic framework. And in fact, I would think that's one thing that we want to stipulate, that we would want to maintain that kind of structure. So subsequent to that, I mean, after the, the articles were in the paper, we've heard from coaches that said, you know, I'm going to be getting home at 7.30 at night. And I'm, cer I'm certainly mindful of that. So th there's that challenge, scheduling, uh, um, scheduling contests, uh, with other districts who don't have a late start date is, is, is equally a challenge. So the other thing that's kind of surfaced is that I heard from several faculty that it would be fair to think of the morning as a potential one practice time, if that made sense, and that it could also be that there's some kind of arrangement where the after, su after school support framework could get shifted to the morning. Kids who wanted additional support they could they they could come early, so I, there would be contractual things with that. So those are those are, and I think this is the heart of your, your concern is those are things that need to be worked out, right. Right. right? But but the essential thing I want I want to say is that I wouldn't I, I can't imagine a scenario where we would compromise on having those basic structures at the school. You want to jump? So I'm a little concerned, a second meeting here, we didn't have the elementary school principals in the first meeting. Here we are in the second, there's still no elementary principals. Why, why is that? The Do we feel that that input is not as vital as the secondary principals input? Um, the yeah. elementary principals have been in the conversation since the start um, from the school conversations and weighed in on what they preferred in terms of a switch time and they were much more comfortable with this model than moving a half an hour later. So they were in from the beginning and um, 
could come and talk about the elementary, but it really was shifting um, the question of whether to shift the later start time to the secondary was the charge of the regional committee. There's a secondary effect on the elementary, That's, uh, but it wasn't the primary group that was deciding whether there was a benefit, because there isn't necessarily a benefit or a detriment to, um, based on the research, the elementary students. It was more of a logistical, how would we work it out when, a, if a decision were made to move later start. So that's where, um, although if the committee in Amherst would like to hear from the Amherst principals, more than happy to have them come to the next meeting. I'd like to hear also from the, the staff in the elementary schools. It would be great to have them surveyed. Uh, my my they concern. Were they were they were originally. Oh, were they? Yes. Okay, yes. I didn't see that. In, yes, in so we have that as well. Okay. Yeah. Michael, um, I have unconcerns. I guess since I'm new to the committee, I'll just share. You know, both where I'm coming from personally, and then with with uh, Shutesbury. Um, Chris might have shared that we had a forum that was joint Shutesbury Leverett a bunch of months ago. Um, mm -hmm. And it was a combination of elementary and secondary parents. And what the Shutesbury School Committee did was endorse the, the flip and move. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there was a general sense that if we postponed it for the, the year plus scenario, that we would have a time to um, figure out some of the details. But from the elementary perspective, <coughs> um, there was support that we'd figure it out. And I, I think it's relevant only because the logistics are harder in Shutesbury and Larbert just by distance. Um, and, you know, I think just in response to some of the details, my sense, I'm actually very excited about it. I, I find that the inertia around this issue is huge and that, you know, there's just so many concerns and what ifs that it just draws back to the status quo um, that you guys are going to do due diligence about figuring out the details, you know, but you can only go so far until you know it's a reality and it's really complex because if it wasn't really complex, it would never happen. Um, you know, this is, this is why it's such a big issue. Um, so I, I appreciate, I think, Mark, what you're saying, which is that there's some values put in place, you know, in a, is a bucket. This is the value we're going to maintain here, here, and here, and then below that we'll get details. So if, you know, you guys commit to that, I think then you've got some time to figure out the details. Oh, Rob, just getting back to the sports um, scheduling, scheduling competitions with other districts who don't have a later start time and or practice. Do we have a good feel of how Holyoke does that? Uh, so Holyoke didn't shift theirs by quite as much as we did, I believe. I don't know if anybody has the exact. I think is what they were, a half an hour shift I think on. it was a half think, an hour yeah. shift. But they originally had started at <coughs> 7, I believe. Mm -hmm. and I think they moved to 7.30. Um, so they've basically shifted most of their um, <clears throat> their competitions from 4 to 4.30 that are the ones after school. Um, and I think I get the sense that for the most part it's worked. Um, I think it's challenging for them at times um, to start at 4.30, especially early in the spring um, and later in the fall when you start running into issues with light. And some schools mm -hmm. have artificial light that, that allows them to, to go further on into the evenings and some schools don't. Um, so uh, there are so many variables within this, and I appreciate you <laughs> seeing that, um, mm -hmm. that um, it, it's hard to figure them all out ahead of time until mm -hmm. we really start to get into deciding whether, you know, this is something we're, we're going to do or not. Um, but I know, you know, there have been challenges for Holyoke, but they're also still competing in all the same sports that they were, they were before. But it is a little different in terms of the time. Mm -hmm. It's not quite as... <coughs> quite as uh, far on in the day. Annie. Um, uh, in one of the emails we received, um, a, a person from Leverett had sent in about Bellingham School, I think it was, um, where they have a flexible schedule um, where students can take uh, public transportation to school at, um, at one time and then um, take the buses at like this till 745. Um, but I like the fact that this flexibility and what you're talking about, like that there could be um, academic support in the mornings for teachers and students who do perform better in the morning that there may be some kind of flexibility to work that out um, or for students who want to be able to do afternoon activities earlier to maybe um, do an online course or a, a morning course that, that there be some flexibility that if they can get themselves to school they can they can do that I don't know if we can do bus passes or things So Holyoke starts at 8.15.
So that was the official word. Um, I just want to say in terms of the, the after school, um, sports are less of an issue at the middle school. We will run all our same sports, and uh, we, we just don't do as many hours in terms of things. So it'll, it'll be, uh, I think, much easier for us to work it out. Um, the, in terms of the after school, I think, uh, reiterating what Mark said, so the default for the middle school will be everybody, everything pushes an hour and a half. And then um, if we're starting at 9 o'clock, that will open up opportunities. So we have some situations where we have, you know, teachers, tutors, things like that, working with kids um, past the contractual time. So, you know, we, we put funding towards it and all those different things. So with those types of opportunities, we can look at flexing and, and um, having – you know some opportunities at the beginning of the day of course we will run into um, a transportation issue at that point because the, the reality of it is you, you wouldn't have an additional run early in the day but then maybe public transportation and things like that would give just another opportunity Catherine. yeah I guess um, I want to I, I agree with Michael um, that you know, change is really, really hard, and this is a big change um, with lots of complicating features. Uh, but I also, having read, again, the literature <laughs> and read some of the letters that have come in, and there was a very compelling letter today from a sleep doctor uh, who's been doing this for years who talked about how significant this extra sleep can be for adolescents. Um, and so if we think about our job as a school district, which is to do, again, provide the best environment we can for our students to learn, um, this makes sense. And yes, there are a lot of things that need to be worked out. Um, I agree with Vince that athletics is incredibly important. And I don't, I'm not hearing that we're not going to have any athletics. We're going to have opportunities, lots of opportunities, for kids to be on teams and have practice and um, get the extracurriculars that um, they're currently having and get their after-school help. Um, and that there are some elementary school things as well that we need to work out. Mm -hmm. But I do get the sense um, that over the next 16 months, these are things that, that we can figure out. Um, so I guess I wanted to say that, and um, I'm sort of, again, thinking about Northampton and how, sort of how many years this has been going on there, and now their school committee having charged their superintendent to make this happen somehow. and. Um, I, and I think because they also recognize the compelling nature of the research and how much this will benefit a lot of students, most students. Um, so I, I guess I just wanted to say that. And, and I understand that this is hard. Um, I, so I don't want to sound like I don't, I don't, I don't <coughs> understand that this is going to be difficult for individual families and, and for different groups. And, I think it really is our job now to figure out what's best for adolescents and how are we going to deal with the things that come up if we, and I hope, do make this change. So, um, so first I just have kind of a small question, um, and this isn't as significant as like some of the things you guys are saying, but what if we changed? the start time much later, what would that mean for kids who want to take college classes? Because I know a lot of those, like I'm taking two in the fall, one's at two, and I think the other's around two or 2.30, and if we started um, later, then a lot of those kids wouldn't be able to take classes at two or 2.30 because they'd have to, because you know, E-period would end. I mean, E-period would start mm -hmm. a lot later. I don't know what that would mean, because that's something you can't really reschedule. So. So we just learned to keep. Um, <laughs> you know, in all the feedback that we had that I've taken, only nobody's raised that. Mm -hmm. So it, it is it is something to think about because particularly Amherst College accommodates us mm -hmm. by trying to schedule 
an upper level calculus class at a time that matches the unique period. And if we did this, we'd be very dependent on them coming with us mm -hmm. to still provide that opportunity. So I'm glad you just said that. So do I have an answer to that? I don't, but I, I now have the thought in my head. So. Um, and one other thing, um, just kind of going off, because you were saying about like with LS and so on, I did do a little survey. I got, um, I asked nine juniors, nine sophomores, 12 seniors, and 12 freshmen, just to get like a kind of large mm -hmm. amount. So out of that 42, 15, said that they want it to stay the way it is. 21 said that they would want to push half an hour back, and then only six said 9 a.m. Mm -hmm. to 3.15, and the main, or 3.35. Um, and the main reasons for that, I mean, a lot of them said sports, obviously, mm -hmm. um, but a lot of them said that um, option keeping in mind with sports and extracurriculars and college classes, option number two, which was, um, I had just put them in order, it was uh, pushing half an hour back would mean that our sleep cycles could kind of change and adjust to that and you'd get more sleep um, and you'd get used to getting a little more sleep and a lot of people were saying that getting up at six is hard because it's still dark out and it's like it seems like it's night and you don't want to get up and I know I agree with that if it's lighter out you're more inclined to get up um, and that and obviously options two and three both would mean that we're more awake in the mornings um, I, a lot of people have trouble first period um, and then by the end of the day, you're exhausted. But so those were the main ones. And then a lot of people did say option one that they wouldn't mind it staying the way it is because we're used to it. Um, extracurriculars and everything start earlier, and you can take the college classes, and it's kind of we're all used to it. But that was the data that I got. Thank okay. you. Anyone who hasn't gotten a chance to speak? I'd love to go. Okay, Debbie. So I, I actually agree with most of what Catherine said. I, I mean, I do think it is our job to do what's best for our students, but I just don't want to lose sight of the fact that we also have the end of the day to be concerned about. We're not only concerned about the beginning of the day, and I think it's important for us in our jobs as school co committee members to be responsible for what we're actually voting for. And, and that, that is my concern. I want to, you know, I think I agree these are probably things that can be worked out, but until we know what the answers are, I just, I, I'm not sure how we can vote yes, absolutely. I mean, I guess we could take a vote on do you move forward with creating the details, but, you know, again, I go back to the presentation that Sharon gave to their school committee, which contained, you know, block by block the time of day, you know, at, you know the time that, that the, the change would be, you know, the, immense detail on, on what it would mean for their students and I just think it's important and it is our responsibility as school committee members to pay attention to those things and I do think forcing kids or, or having kids not home till 7, 7.30 in the evening can be very problematic you know, for many kids and I think, it, I, I think it's important not to lose sight of that. Did you say something? Yeah, but you could do the microphone. Um, well, I would just, I think um, the, the hard thing is for, um, there, there are lots of circumstances like when we redistricted. I mean, there were a certain level of details known, and then there's a certain level of details that are handed to the administration to make work. So I guess that's, I think, where people are struggling with the comfort zone of saying, do we acknowledge that, um, which is what I believe, that the sleep study the research in itself is so compelling that it says it's an, it's unnatural to have kids waking up at this time and that it is detrimental to them in terms of their well-being overall and in particular the students who really struggle are those who are hit the hardest with this um, getting up early and going to school and I will there be an effect and I know I'm going to say that again yes there will be effect on some sports but it's like weighing the options of of what is more compelling to us as a committee, and I trust that we will have to, and we have you know, 16, 15 months to do this work, to say what is that specifically going to look like? Because quite honestly, we don't know what the the high school schedule will look like in, or the middle school schedule in what year are we talking about? 2014, 13, 14, because it's we're also in that opportunity to take a look at our whole structure at the same time. So I. I I don't want to get lost, and sometimes we can almost get lost in all the details because we can't do all of the details right now. 
We really cannot without <clears throat> being engaged in a real conversation. Michael, then, Mike. Yeah, I, just two things picking on up what Maria was just saying. Um, I think if we ended up doing the details, it, it, and one, it's an immense amount of work, but it, mm -hmm. it sets up a situation where it's going to impact some people in negative ways and impact people in positive ways, and other people won't care because of their scenarios. But mm -hmm. rather than sort of take it at the higher level of saying what's the right thing to do based on you know what the evidence is and what, what we're trying to do as a district, which I think should be the leading one as opposed to on the micro level. The other thing which you alluded to, which I wanted to pick up on, in the minutes, I think it was Kip who was talking about homework and then Vince was talking about you know physical education. And I think those are both huge issues. I the, what I, the way I see this is that there's structure that's in place, that's in place for a long period of time and there's inertia that sets in. And what this does, it frees that up. So if you change the way things work, then it opens up the door to bigger discussions about how we deal with homework, um, how we incorporate physical education and age of obesity, for example. I mean, those are really important things to do, but Unless you first move something, nothing moves. And this, I think, is the first important thing to move. And then you have a shift and you can have subsequent conversations. So I just want to say two things. One thing is um, I got a lot of letters from middle schoolers about this because uh, of their learning persuasive letter writing. <laughs> <laughs> they were all very respectful. Um, but it was, it was interesting. They, they, they expressed a lot of um, essentially some just saying, that would be awesome. I don't want to have to get up at 6 or 6.30 anymore. And others that were concerned about what does their after school look like. And uh, one was worried about when would detention happen. Um, <laughs> another one, another good one was uh, a student who was very against it because he was worried he wouldn't get home in time for Futurama. Um, so, but but it, it was it was pretty um, similar in terms of a split on on the different views that, that people looked at, and I'm actually going and talking to a couple of classes about it. I already I already talked to one. Um, it, it's kind of interesting. A lot of the same conversation happens mm -hmm. at that table as you guys are having here. The the one other piece in terms of the details on the the times. My understanding at this point, in terms of particularly the region. Everything moves an hour and a half, and the only thing that that we leave uh, stays open is the sports. Is the sports we don't have all the details figured out, and we do have, you know, Rich put put together a long spreadsheet that had all the details on on how every sport was affected, potentially affected by this, and potential solutions um, that he would work on. And, and I think one thing to keep in mind is. At that level of work, Rich doesn't actually know until he goes to actually schedule the golf matches what schools will allow him to figure them out on Saturday and which schools, you know. And, and so there is a piece to that that will happen once he, he sits down and has to actually schedule them, um, which, which changes how when he talks to other athletic directors as opposed to saying, if we do this, what are some possibilities? Um, and then just the, the one other piece is – uh, at the elementary schools, and I can't speak as well to this, but my understanding is is it's less of a shift. It's a 25-minute shift, but essentially everything would shift the 25 minutes. And um, you know, I, I think it's been really interesting. Uh, from I've learned a lot about the elementaries in terms of after-school buses and after-school programs and all those different things, and it brought up a lot of things <coughs> that that um, it sounds like Maria and the principals of the elementary schools are now currently working on. Um, but my my understanding is also at that it's all going to be a, a 25 minute shift. Mm -hmm. um, so so if, but if there is more specifics that need to be known, um, I, I do think it would have to be in the athletic realm, and, and I'm not positive how much more we could do until it becomes more concrete. So so I, I've been thinking the same thing as Mike. Just be, that'd be based on your comments, and so. This is really the wrong time of year to take on something huge, right? And yet I understand the press on the school committee to bring into focus details that aren't micro, but details that are significant. Can somebody paint a broad picture of what the afternoon would look like, right? And so the, so the picture that I had is Rich, Rich Month on a monthly basis goes to an athletic director's meeting, right? All the athletic directors of all the teams in the, in, in the conference and periodically prin principals go along. So what I would recommend, which is kind of a, a middling position, is that we take our act on the road to the athletic director's meeting, right? And we put our proposal in front of them and we try to gauge their re receptivity to coming along with us down the road mm -hmm. and meeting us at some point. And, that, and that's the question, where could you meet us on this? If we wanted to maintain the integrity of the conference, you want to keep us on your schedule, what would you do? 
So rather than getting into the business of email and putting Rich on the phone, maybe we work the athletic, the, the executive of the PVIAC to get us on the agenda when we go and we make a 10 minute presentation and solicit kind of the broad pattern of feedback. And I think that would be useful to you in, in having Debbie's, an answer to Debbie's question come into focus, which wouldn't go to the same level of, so right. could we get that golf meeting in on Tuesday oh, the 3rd, right? right. right? But, it's, but it's, it's what, would, what could the broad pattern of conference competition look like in, the, in light of the proposal that we're making? So I don't know when the next one is scheduled, but I assume they're monthly, right? So let, let's see if we can get on the agenda and maybe subsequent we can come back before the end of the school year and, and paint, paint a broader picture or a cleaner picture. Yes, Shabazz. So, you know, um, it is an, uh, an important uh, policy shift we are asked to consider here. Um, however, it strikes me that we're talking about this as a later start time proposal but there are actually two proposals here. There is a later start time proposal that affects the secondary school, but then there is an earlier start time proposal that affects our elementary schools. And I don't see that we are properly addressing the elementary, the earlier start time proposal for the elementary students. I could vote tonight in favor of doing it if it's just the later start time proposal as concerns the evidence, as concern the, the way students have weighed in, as concern um, the kind of lingering questions out there, having trust that with the, the year or more that we have to work it out, that we can put it in the hands of, of our administration and, and um, perhaps with the reopener clause, but, um, but I feel we could do that. But I don't see the, the proper uh, consideration being given to the earlier start time proposal that we also face here. Now, of course, we're not doing it for any benefit for the elementary school. I understand that. This is about a benefit that we, can, that we are convinced is important for our secondary school students. But, we, but there still is a relationship here to the experiences and to the, the questions of enrollments, the questions of um, uh, the, the proper education that we're charged to look out for for our elementary school students that, for me, that is my lingering point in this. Uh, and so between now and May 22nd, uh, I could be certainly in a much more comfortable pos uh, position mm -hmm. if I feel that we're addressing the earlier start time aspect of this proposal. So, um, you know, Catherine, as, as chair, will be setting up our agenda meeting for the 15th, so that topic could come on. Yeah, um, what we could do, too, is just revisit the survey data that was conducted for elementary families as well as elementary staff. Um, and when we went to the <coughs> forums, we did have data that was specific to elementary, so we can kind of call that out and mm -hmm. sit with it and talk about what that means in terms of a, the 25-minute um, difference. The, the reality is, if region votes this, then we still have to have votes of the elementary schools, so we have to be really conscious of, and I know that uh, Kip and Michael have been having conversations in um, Leverett and Shutesbury uh, to, um, to kind of gauge the receptiveness of the, not only the um, community, but also the principals, the staff, um, and such. It's and, and the principals, the elementary school principals will be there on the 15th? Yes. So yes. Um, I, mm -hmm. I think we should have that. Yep. Yep. Uh, and that, that raises a concern I have. Uh, thank you very much for the follow-up information. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the pieces of information I requested last time was the demographic data. And absent the demographic data, the survey is no good. We don't know who's being surveyed. Uh, we and and another concern I do have actually about the survey is is the construction of the questions. We're not particularly scientific. I have some serious concerns about that. Um, can I? Yep. And then I'd love. I know Mike wants to jump in on. Um, there were so get, information was ga gathered in two ways. One was the survey itself, whether you know. The structure of the survey which I know we can take a look at again uh, the demographics of the survey is was not able to be 
disaggregated. Right. However, the one point that the school committee was specific to looking at in terms of the demographic was um, income eligible families. So that was the demographic that people were um, suggesting may not be um, represented well by people who typically come op often to school committee meetings. So we wanted to make sure that population was reached out to. And at the secondary level, that did happen. At the elementary level, I did it happen? There? Oh, it did. So Marta, her staff made specific phone calls and uh, translated phone calls, you know, bilingual um, staff made the phone calls. So we do have the demographics from that specific population that I'd be happy to present fully. Do we have the questions? Because I'd like to make sure that those yes. questions were scientifically sound from a yeah. statistical point of view. So, asking so the, the question, uh, I can tell you what yeah. it was. It was, sure. it was a phone call um, or a survey monkey, and, and essentially what it was asking is how it, would it make, um, I can't remember the exact wording, but did it make their family, like planning around the school day, did it make it harder, easier, or equivalent? Uh, That's trouble. Okay. Uh, because it needs, whenever you have a question like that, you really do need to elicit specific circumstances uh, around, you know, when it's say about your day, your work day, your family day. Uh, yeah, so, so we were talking about their family schedule, and, yeah. and we told them specific times. Okay. Um, this was conducted by, by Marta and, and uh, her office. Um, so, so I did, and that was the request of the school committee. That's exactly what they requested. I, I know it was before you joined. Yeah. But when we had the original conversation, that was their concern. That particular demographic was the concern, and that's what our follow-up to it was. Um, I also wanted to address the thing in, in terms of the elementary schools. Um, we actually, I do feel like we've spent a fair amount of time engaging in the elementary schools about, about the different possibilities. The original recommendation that went out was actually the half hour shift forward. Mm -hmm. And w after lots of conversations with the elementary um, principals and, and families and looking at that schedule, yeah. that was actually why we went away from that um, because we, we actually thought the half hour was, you know, kind of an easier thing to think about at the, at the regional level in terms of having less of an effect. But then when we were looking at the elementary schools, there was a, a wider concern around that. And so that's why we actually went, and, and it was actually the, the school committee when we, also when we came back, the school committee want, really wanted us to push that the maximum effect happens when you go to 9 o'clock and at the same time that for um, the elementary schools, uh, the administration and the and the families there was a there was a much larger concern about them moving at half hour back because then school was starting at I think it was nine something yeah, and, was and that yeah, and yeah, that really child became child a problem for families in terms of the morning childcare. Uh, child care in the morning so if I could just make if I could yes. I, I didn't mean to be oppositional or anything if I could no, just no, get no. the questions that that were of asked course. how how well it was teased out yep. so that we could see sure. the specific impact that would be great Debbie. Okay, and I know you all think I'm just resistant to change, but <laughs> I, I'm going to go anyway here. To, to Lawrence's point, one of the things that came up in one of the forums that I was at, which I, I thought at the time was a good idea and I thought we might actually do it, but, but it doesn't look like we did, is um, some of the parents said when they were filling out the survey, it was sort of, you know, oh, theoretically, what if this? And, and now that we've kind of narrowed down, c come to an actual proposal where there are times around it, framed around it, don't we think there's valuable, there, that it, there'd be some value to resurveying both parents and students to say, okay, this is, this is now what we're talking about, the, the, these are the, this is the concrete information. That was the suggestion that came up at the forum that I thought was a good one, but I don't know if other people agree with that. Michael? Um, just factually from the Shrewsbury perspective, um, in the last year the Shrewsbury School Committee has had two presentations, originally Josh came up and then Mike came up the second time, so we've had two full school mm -hmm. committee discussions upon, about this. Mm -hmm. We've had two surveys both of parents and staff um, with the initial proposal and then the, the tweak proposal subsequently mm -hmm. and a forum where we had decent turnout. Um, and we've consulted with the superintendent for Unit 28, which is our elementary school superintendent as well as our principal. Um, there was some staff at the meeting, but also the principal consulted with staff. And the Shrewsbury School Committee unanimously endorsed the idea of a change. You know, we didn't have a proposal. We're waiting for the region to make a vote. But 
um, when Kristen was the representative, we took a, a basically a straw vote saying that we wanted we supported a change, and depending upon what the region would do. So, in terms of where one of the member towns' elementary schools are, mm -hmm. we're fully on board, and I think we've done due diligence on our part. So. I'm just going to say this. So from what it sounds like, uh, the, <coughs> from what Mike was saying, the elementary schools, it was easier from, for them to not do the half an hour pushing. Mm -hmm. Like that was the, the hardest one for them to adjust to? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was actually easier to the, – the, the current proposal on the table is a bigger shift for the region. It's the hour and 15-minute change. But that coming back in uh, the 25 minutes – was easier for elementary families logistically because most of the elementary schools don't have before care, um, before school care. And so with it being pushed back to, I think, the 9, 10 or so, uh, it basically became, uh, most of, all our schools have an after school program, so that could be flexed, but we'd essentially have to add before school, add before okay. school care in some way for mm -hmm. to, to be able to make that one actually a viable option. Okay. So I'm just, oh, sorry. Okay. No, I was just gonna finish. Um, so I guess, from my perspective, if I'm if I'm just looking at the high school, like the secondary education, middle school, high school, I think that's first of all. I think especially high school is a much more um, important like years of a student's life than elementary school, and I think that it is more important to look at. The <laughs> <laughs> okay, no, but but okay, no, but I'm saying <laughs> it's okay, Zoe. We're with you. Go right ahead. <laughs> Stop but laughing at okay, always fine. So, so if but if we're looking at elementary and high school and middle school, I mm -hmm. personally would, would vote to keep it the same because I think that the huge jump for switching times, first of all, you know, in um, before the NIAS people came, we were looking at we read we were supposed to read over the social justice and practices mm -hmm. and the whole last part was about students and community and the opportunities that students have in the community and you know I that's a big part that's for me academics are really important and I think our school school does a great job with academics and I think that like I was saying before with the college classes that's a huge thing that students get to do like you don't get to do that in a lot of places mm -hmm. go to Amherst College for free take classes and that was the, the last point of that so I think that in that aspect pushing it half an hour back would work for that, but I think that if you include the elementary school, it I would vote for it to stay the same, so that kids, so that that can still be present in the mm -hmm. society. I, thank you. Yeah, I'm trying um, it, it's been a pretty exciting past two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> that's probably. That's probably an understatement. Um, I've received, uh, as many of you have, numerous <laughs> emails and other correspondence from uh, particularly people in Leverett. Um, and they, many of them, not all, but many of them took me to task for saying that my constituents did not support the change. I've also received correspondence from uh, constituents who wanted to remain the same. Um, also in the two weeks, I've made a concerted effort to study much more carefully, much more closely the research, and I still don't find it good research. Um, I think it ignores a social context. I think we do not pay enough attention to the details of adolescent lives specifically such things as the consumption of sugar and caffeine during the day, which we don't know how that impacts sleep patterns. I read very carefully Dr. Neely's email, um, a, uh, an expert in the field of sleep disorders, and I found it interesting that in the course of her letter or email, she noted several adults who suffer from so-called sleep disorders. And I was puzzled by that. Are sleep disorders or problems with sleeping unique to adolescents? Um, apparently not. And so I wonder why aren't we talking about 
other people's sleep disorders here. Um, I just think the, the research to me, um, and I'm not a scientist, I'm not a trained researcher, and I don't pretend to be, but I do see holes in the research. Having said all that, I think that the decision should be made very quickly because I think the longer this lingers out there, it's not going to become an issue based upon impact on family or the research. It's going to come down to an emotional play, which I think it's already had some, some beginnings of, and I'm worried about that, that we'll make a decision based upon emotional response to whatever problem we're faced with. So I would certainly hope that we make a decision on March 22nd. Um, my constituents are split. Um, I'm not. I'm still not in favor of this change. Um, and I suspect my next two weeks will be pretty busy as well. Catherine? <laughs> 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 I'm not going to debate the, I, I won't debate the research with you, Kip. Um, uh, although I did have, I did want to address the idea of, of sleep disorders. I don't think we're talking about sleep disorders here. I think there are adults with sleep disorders. I think there are adolescents with sleep disorders. Um, we're talking about a natural sleep rhythm uh, of adolescents. And um, I think that was Dr. Neely's point that she, that she would see adolescents as patients who suffered sleep disorders, um, but discovered that when they had a later start time in schools, um, their sleep disorders disappeared. And so she was making a distinction, I thought, the way I read it, was that she was making a distinction between actual sleep disorders, medically defined, and uh, kids, adole normal adolescents who just weren't getting enough sleep. So um, I think there probably are adolescents with diagnosable <coughs> sleep disorders, but she was saying most, most, uh, that, that they're on occasion, they were not sleep disorders, and we're not talking about adolescents having sleep disorders in this conversation. Kip, then Rob. Yeah, just two quick points. Um, first, um, I, um, <laughs> I, I can't help, I can't get over the hump of, of looking at classroom instruction and wondering if youngsters are not engaged because the instruction practice or the instructional activity that they are being exposed to is not engaging. Um, the survey identifies a majority of youngsters who fall asleep in school occasionally without any definition of what occasionally is. What does that mean? Once a week, once a day, once a month, once a semester? What is occasionally? Um, I'm not going to deny that kids don't fall asleep, but I wonder if we're not also missing what are we asking kids to do in school that's causing them or contributing to their putting their heads down on their desk. And I'm, I'm not unconvinced that instructional activities don't have something to do with that. If you engage kids, in a serious, respectful manner, they'll stay with you. They'll stay awake. I firmly believe that. Well, I want to also um, back what Catherine was just saying. Number one, that I don't think we're talking about sleep disorders. We're talking about natural circadian rhythms and natural sleep cycles. And I wanted to put out a hypothetical out there for anyone who feels that there isn't a natural circadian sleep cycle that would affect how teenagers fall asleep at night and when they're able to get up in the morning then we could hypothesize for both all the adults who teach at our schools and the kids who go to them, we could start it at 3 a.m. We could have them get up at 2 a.m. and start at 3 a.m. and say it doesn't matter. They can go to bed earlier. They can go to bed at 6 p.m. the next day and we can start school at 3 a.m. But believe me, every adult in there and every kid in there would be devastatingly tired. Mm -hmm. um, and it wouldn't matter how much you engage them in the classroom, they would be devastatingly tired because it would go against their natural sleep cycle. I speak of this somewhat of experience in my own job since I do have to work night shifts and you can't sleep enough or at the right times to make it make up for your natural circadian rhythm. And I know we're not talking about something that drastic for getting up at 6 a.m., but it's fairly drastic enough for the natural adolescent sleep cycle. And so I just wanted to give that example because I think 
if you say you don't believe that it's, it's a natural circadian sleep cycle that's pushing a later sleep time for adolescents, try to think of it in more drastic terms, and I think you'd, you'd realize what the research is trying to say. Catherine. I'm sorry, just my last, uh, I promise, Kim. Um, <laughs> but said to start but I'm talking about <laughs> now, starting now, um, uh, I guess just to your other point about engaging teaching, um, when you when you look at the districts that have had a late start, I have to imagine and have seen um, students coming in more awake, um, uh, changes in. Uh, achievement, uh, especially for for um, you know a struggling population, uh, reduction in automobile accidents, uh, and bent better overall mental health. Um, I don't think all of those districts suddenly changed, um, and their teaching became more compelling. I think it has to, you know that it's related to the kids are more awake. And um, I think if you talk to students at ARHS um, on a late start day, that would be an interesting thing to look at. You know, do the teachers all of a sudden become more compelling or are these kids just more awake and therefore first period and maybe second period, they're more engaged, so. So. <clears throat> just a quick comment. Um, from my experience on late start days, I don't, I've talked to, like, a couple of my friends agree with me. I don't know, majority, obviously, I haven't talked to people about this. Um, I think I'm, weirdly enough, usually more tired on late start days because I don't know if that has to do with the whole reason, like, we get, we're so used to getting up at 6 that, and I'm always more tired on weekends also when I get to sleep in. Mm -hmm. I don't know, I don't know what that has to do with, and if it's, my friends, I know some of my friends are like that too. I don't know if that, if that's obviously for majority, but just. Adding in. One thing I want to make sure before we end this discussion is what more information the regional okay. committee wants, if any. I've heard information that we might want it on the elementary level that we could mm -hmm. have at the next yeah. Amherst meeting and at the next Pell meeting, I guess. Um, so that can be handled that way. But on the regional, on the secondary school level, um, so some things I've heard are that you'd like but we may not get is um, a really detailed sports schedule, like what exactly would it look like? A, a, not a detailed sports schedule, but I would like to hear what the other superintendents think of this, you know, if you, if, I mean superintendents, yeah. athletic directors, <laughs> thank you, uh, and the PBIAC, whether they, you know, whether it seems like this is something that's going to be reasonable or whether we're going to have to early release our athletes for every single match, whether it's home or away. Um, so that I think mm -hmm. would be, I would okay. want to uh, know. And, oh, and whether there's any consideration, would be any consideration given to limiting the amount of time allowed for practice. I'd kind of like to know whether that's on the board, or being considered at all. And then another thing was college classes. Uh, mm -hmm. How would that be affected? Anything else Just on secondary level? Were the, the phone surveys done with the parents of students on the secondary level? Yes. So I would love to get yeah. the text of the survey sure. and demographics of the survey. Yeah. Okay. So I think all of that we could have by May 22nd, except I'm not sure about. We have to see when. Right. So, so, so what I would say is I, I don't know when the meeting is. Do you know when it is? The next one is at the beginning of June, and the agenda for that is mostly. <coughs> well, so. Okay. So this is what I would suggest as an alternative that. That we, I'm going to ask the athletic director when I see him mm -hmm. Good. <laughs> to <laughs> get a list of the ADs and either he creates a bulk email or he gets on the phone, but we have to be able to take the pulse. Yes. And the essential question is, will you, can you come along with us down this road? Can we maintain our competitive relationship yeah. in the context of a later start time? Thank so you. it would be easy if we got, a, if we had easy, uh, we could go to the meeting if we can't. I think that's what I'm going to ask the athletic director to do. Great. Can, can I say, can well, can enjoy. Well, oh, without a doubt. <laughs> <laughs> well, and the athletic director can also send the, the letter to the, to the superintendent, who can also send it out to the superintendent. There you at the go. Same time. There you go. You always have a friend in the superintendent. There you go. Right. Can, can I say one thing? Just respond to Kip. So I, I got on this bandwagon late, right? I didn't get out of the gate 
as quickly as everybody else. But so here's the context for me that we're. He's her anchor. <laughs> what? You're our anchor. Gonna be gay, going slow. Yeah. Good job. Drag on. Don't give up the day job. Right. right. <laughs> <laughs> so, so thirty over thirty years ago when I started in this profession, nobody talked about the whole child. It was academics early, academics late. As, the, as we pushed through the 80s, we pushed through the 90s, coming with the standards movement, people started asking a wider set of questions. Are kids clothed? Are they fed? Are they warm? Are they safe? So I see this as the next logical iteration of the widening angle of concerns that educators legitimately have to have to create a context within which we can be as effective as we can. Right? So if I put this in a 30-year continuum, it makes sense, because if, if I'm trusting the research and I'm trusting the, 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 me the medical people, there's a real biological substratum to this, right? As is the need for kids not to be hungry, to be warm, to be safe. And those are necessary preconditions of them being academically successful. So, for what it's worth. Did, uh, so, um, I want to come back at one other thing on where do teachers stand on the issue. You know, uh, the... I guess from last uh, meeting, that was um, didn't do a good job of trying to to express what the input I was interested in from teachers. Where are teachers on this? It isn't. Do you think it's a great idea? Do you think it's a bad idea? Do you think it's very important for the for the emotional, intellectual well-being and growth of our students and will affect teacher and learning in great ways or not. It's really not that aspect. I just really wonder, and perhaps you all, being on the line with them every day, have that sense. But do you, so I, I'll, I'll raise it to you then, do you get a sense from, uh, are there any kinds of questions, are there any kinds of um, additional input that or, or concerns that you're hearing raised from your faculty that you work with that we that that ought to be a part of uh, our consideration in terms of of of, uh, of the issue of this policy. I assume since you're in support of it, you've already reconciled and resolved all of those whatever input you've gotten from or, or feedback you've gotten from your faculty about uh, this change from 7.45 to, to 8.45 or 9 a.m. I'm not sure if we're at 8.45 or 9 a.m., but, but, um, but I, I guess you've resolved it uh, to your satisfaction, but that's really what I had in mind when I say the feedback from teachers. Do they have ideas, uh, both positive, both um, uh, things that, that might be part of the hurdles that we'll be looking at over the year that we ought to think about or have in mind now as we weigh, ultimately weigh our, our vote on this. So that's what I had in mind, rather than just are they going to come along contractually or not, or do we throw the book at them? Mike? So um, the, what I've heard is um, the, uh, any concerns that I've heard have been around uh, their own personal lives. Um, the, uh, from the middle school perspective, there hasn't been any concerns raised about uh, our programming. Um, <coughs> you know, the, we haven't had a faculty meeting on it, but the, in conversations, informal conversations over time, there's, it's been acknowledged that for middle school, it's, uh, it uh, didn't feel right to start at the time that we did. So, but we have heard, and I think it's realistic, I've heard from probably three or four um, teachers who have kids and go to elementary schools and, and it's, it'll affect my family's life. Um, so uh, th that's, that's the piece that we heard. Well, one other thing I actually wanted to say, to, and I'm actually not trying to convince Kip to change his vote. Um, <laughs> it's getting very complicated. <laughs> so all I want so my my we sent the the, the 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 Gazette articles of the last two meetings when these were discussions we forwarded to the faculty, okay. right? So though they participated in the survey a year ago, the issues laid largely dormant, and this catalyzed a resurgence of interest. Yeah. And I would say to you, and I th I think this holds up that my my email is running fifty fifty. Mm -hmm. People love it, can't wait for it. People who are deathly afraid of it. 
and largely the frame of reference though is not the research. The frame of reference is what we'll do, what we'll do to their programs that they run, the sports that they coach, with their family lives. They're at the level of trying to work out the specifics of them. But it isn't in the context of whether or not it's education beneficial. They're just trying to wrap their head around the logistics of it. So, so that's been the latest, latest round of feedback. There. If I could just follow up to say, you know, I, I have no problems making um, uh, a vote on, uh, on, a, on an issue where, you know, it, it's not like 90% of Amherst is all ready for this. You know, that's fine if we're in a situation where it's 60-40 running through the community or running through the region or even 50-50. If that's where, but we ought to at least let people know we're hearing you. We're hearing all sides of this. We're thinking through why it's at 50 50. And we're coming to a really serious decision about it, understanding that it's contentious, understanding that different people are seeing it different ways, and, 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 and those ways all are worthy of respect. But then we're going to, at the end of the day, do our best here, if it's May 22nd or whenever, do our best to make the wisest choice. Thank you. A quick one. I, I just think it's important that, that I think all of Kip's points about instruction and how much sugar kids have, those are all just as important. And I don't want... Um, I think it's important to realize that, that no matter what we do with the late start time, we still keep all those things on, on the plate. And we, you know, if you look at our school improvement plans, our district improvement plans, absolutely looking at how we engage kids um, on a daily basis, you know, we will not <laughs> say, oh, we got that now because we started at the right time. So I just want to be clear about that. And, and then, you know, so a school committee member who, who's no longer in the committee, we, we talked a lot about math. And, and one thing... Um, we were talking about, she was saying, uh, w w textbook, what do you think of the textbook, da, 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 we went back and I said, and I started talking about, well, you know, I really think like training good math teachers is the really important piece and I'm less concerned about the textbook. And then she made an important point to me, which was, well, that's good, I expect that you'd be doing that, but don't you want to start with the best possible textbook? Mm -hmm. And, you know, so I, I think that that applies also here is, you know, absolutely, we want to keep thinking about instruction. How do we engage kids? How do we wake them up and they get their minds going? Because we could certainly put them to sleep at any time of the day easily. <laughs> um, but but what's our best starting point? And I, I think that's the that I think that's the the question. That it's not they're not opposed to each other. Okay, so we should probably wrap this up. And uh, so we'll have some more information at the next meeting, and we'll schedule a vote for the next meeting. If you feel like you're not ready, you don't have to vote, but that's what we'll be scheduling. I just um, want to make one more just, and I know we're closing, but yep. um, I just would like to, um, I want to appreciate Shabazz's comment and about really yeah. valuing everybody's voice in this conversation because it is a big shift. If we make a shift, it's a very big shift. Um, and to recognize that we will have many of us will be affected by a shift some in a positive way some in a negative way and that i want us i really hope that we all keep focused on what we think is actually best for the children mm -hmm. involved yeah. the adults we may all have aggravations in our lives that we have to rearrange but we have we will have a 16 month period to do that but it's, it's going to be hard during something that's so emotional for people that we really try to stay focused on what we truly not that we don't but just you know that's where we all want us we sit when we make this vote thank you all Great. This was a great conversation. Yep. Thank you very much. Thanks. Okay. okay uh, approval of clerical media awards. Um, is clear? Oh, of course. Have a good night, Zoe. Thanks for coming. Good night. Okay. Your voice is great to have in the conversation. Thank you. Um, Annie? <laughs> uh, the Media Clerical Awards, if there's a, um, something to be acknowledged and, and voted, do you want to speak to that since you were involved? Mm. If we can find it in the yeah, packet. Page number, uh, I know I saw it in here. Hold yeah. on a second. Yeah. This is a motion. Do you yeah. see where it is, Annie? Yeah. A motion? That's yeah, so I make a motion. Yeah, do you want to speak a little bit about it before you make the motion, just what, that you were the rep? Or? Um, if not, that's okay. Sure. Uh, we, um, Debbie and, who did we meet with Debbie? Uh, Jennifer Ryan, one of our clerical representatives from the clerical union. Thank you. We met and um, looked through recommendations and, and decided upon um, uh, Terry and Michael um, 
to grant the, to the, the awards for all the positive feedback we've gotten from your superiors. And it is a wonderful opportunity to acknowledge to people who, who are um, doing a wonderful job um, in our school system and, and then it's fun because people get to go and actually give the award, which I know is a good time. So, right. Especially, the, I think, um, for Terry with uh, uh, Miesk and all the work she did with that this year was amazing. And um, for Michael, I think they called him a, a guardian angel. Right. Tonight. Oh, tonight him. That was it. Sorry, he was <laughs> wanted to be knighted. Um, <laughs> they wanted to knight him. So we're lucky to have him. Would someone like to make the motion? So moved. Mm -hmm. Second. 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 Oh. Any discussion. <laughs> all those in favor? Opposed. All right. Great. Thank you all. Approved uh, gifts. <coughs> Okay. I move to approve the following gifts. The Washington Post Company matching gift to support the high school theater program for a total of $1,000. A gift from Stephen and Brill, uh, let me say this right, Katsaratis to the Kingley Perry Award for $500. A gift from Virginia and Daniel St. John to the Kingley Perry Award for $500. A gift from David Perry to the Kingley Perry Award for $500. A gift from Deborah Ritzer to the Kingley Perry Award for $500. A gift from the ExxonMobil Corporation Education's Alliance Program to the High School Math and Science Departments for $500. And a gift from the Rotary Club of Amherst um, to support the banner for Ultimate Tournament for $300. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Opposed? Great. Okay, great. Uh, any reports from subcommittees other than when we get to policy? Um, Thanks. Budget. Okay. Um, yeah. All right. So going on to policy K H B. Um, I'm going to ask uh, Rick to come up okay. if he would, please. Um, do you feel comfortable answering all questions? <laughs> <laughs> Pertaining to this policy. Pertaining to this yeah. policy. Potential yes, policy. I, I don't expect answers yes. from the amount. Uh, um, this is um, a policy that that we submitted to you for you to for you to consider. Um, we're not even on a first vote. Right? Mm. We're just discussing right, just, this. Yes. So um, the policy subcommittee is meeting again on this coming Monday. So we can um, look at your concerns and questions fairly quickly. I just want to add that also on our agenda for Monday and um, for, for um, looking ahead to uh, another item on the next agenda, which is class size discussion. Yes. We're going to try to um, come forward on the 22nd with some wording on class size. Um, I don't want to... Um, you know, mis uh, have you misread what we're going to come up with. It's not necessarily going to be anything close to definitive. It's too difficult a topic and a concept. But we hope to have something for you on the 22nd. But in any case, this is for you to, to, to read, discuss, whatever you want to do with it. Pull it apart. Tell us what you want to see it to added. And um, the athletic director is here to answer any and all questions pertaining to the policy. Mm -hmm. Yes, Michael. Mm -hmm. Just I'm sorry. You want to Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I was That's weird. right. Yeah, Michael, go ahead. <laughs> um, just before I ask questions, to clarify, Debbie said this is pre-first read. Mm -hmm. So this is truly discussion. Yeah. Um, so I had, I guess, one's a logistical question, and then I can give you at least some high-level comments. Um, would it be helpful to email you specific things rather than take up time here? Because um, I, I have a lot. I don't think it violates anything. If you have that many, then send them to me. Okay. Yes. I, as I said, um, on the policy, I'll, you actually, um, yeah, send them to me. Okay. And I'll bring them to the committee on, subcommittee on Monday. Okay. So if the, you're okay the, with that, Mike. Oh yeah. Okay. Um, I think the two high-level things for me, just in terms of us considering it, is um, what are we trying to achieve? You know. So I know in Chutesburg, when we looked at this a few years ago, we really didn't want to have commercialism in the schools. Mm -hmm. um, I understand that there's a balance between sponsorship and sort of support. Um, for different things, but opening the door, I mean, I was listening to a story a few weeks ago where there's school selling their roof space, you know, for advertising, um, so for flybys, literally. Um, so 
in the in the revenue generation category, it's really what are our objectives? Are we trying to narrow the venue which which you can have revenue, or are we trying to sort of just leave it for sponsorships that are already embedded in our activities? That's sort of one clarifying thing. And then I think the other one, which looking at this, although it's titled sponsorship signage and advertising, it's 95% advertising, and it really doesn't get to the sponsorship. And in my research, I did a little offline research online, but. Um, there's a lot of insidious stuff, you know, so there's product placements, there's concepts, and really in terms of advertising, the two things that it's trying to do is brand loyalty, um, number one. So, you know, if, as we're constructing this, it's really less about that is looking at, it, I wrote my notes, oh, it's, it's collecting information, you know, so there's ways of saying I'm giving it for free, but you're really getting consumer information about parents and kids. Uh, that's number one objective of commercial. Mm -hmm. And number two is the brand loyalty. So. You might not sell something now, but you sell something in 20 years. So if we're constructing this in the advertising realm and we want to be cognizant of protecting the kids and, the, and not just delivering mm -hmm. a unit of consumerism, we should be thinking about that. Um, I think first, um, this mm -hmm. is one of many responses to the crisis in the athletic department and the lack okay. of enough sufficient funds. Okay. Second piece of that is um, a feeling, and I think I'm accurate on this, is the um, overuse of booster clubs. Um, they're getting worn out. <laughs> um, and so this is uh, one effort at looking at a way, uh, an alternative of raising funds for the athletic program. Recognizing, and we've talked about this at the subcommittee level, every single concern that you've had, including, but one that you didn't state, uh, is that there are businesses in the area, corporate businesses, that support the district um, in, in some ways pretty substantially. And um, would we allow, you know, would we say no, <laughs> you can't advertise here in any, in any manner, uh, in any medium, um, even though you've, you've contributed a considerable amount of dollars to the district. So that's something that this committee has to deal with. Okay. Just that's, a quick follow-up. So that's, that's why that's why this is before you tonight, to, 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 for the committee to ask and probe those questions. Okay. So I guess to, to follow up and I, really quickly, I'll, I'll, okay. well, Before you do that, I just want to make sure, is that all-encompassing pretty much? Mm -hmm. <laughs> At least in response to that question. Can we go back to what the, sure. I guess, yeah. what the initial sure. I'll just do this, then you can down the floor. I mean, I think the two things would be, if we're focused on the athletic issue, that maybe we actually narrow the focus and title of the, mm -hmm. um, the policy, because right now it's all inclusive. And I think a lot of the things that I was looking into is curricular as opposed to athletic program stuff. So mm -hmm. learning math or counting M&Ms, for example. You know, or can you draw a floor plan from McDonald's? I mean, those things exist. So really being specific about the policy. The other thing I just I would put out to consider is I know in Chutesboro when we looked at um, use of the building, that were really differentiated between local businesses and local nonprofits as opposed to national or state. Um, so if we have genuine businesses that are local and supporting that, we might want to differentiate. You know, so if a national corporation is coming in, that looks really different than something that's you know a Coles. Um, it's all equally a business, but it's grounded here. So something to ponder. Thank you. Rob. Well, a couple of things on that, and I understand the concerns about commercialism. I hesitate. I, I just I want us to recognize that. Although I, I also support local businesses over more national, that's a personal value judgment on mine, and there may be other people within the district or even the school committee that don't hold such values and say it shouldn't be the job of the school committee or the district to say one business is good and the other one is not. And so I want to be careful going forward that we have some sort of way to make sure that this uh, advertising is appropriate but not necessarily uh, biased to one's personal view or one business versus another. Getting to the athletic um, portion of it, I'm a little concerned about the section on the top of the second page about advertising displays during sporting events that it's too restrictive um, because it specifically says that it would be temporary advertising uh, for a limited time of and just prior to a sporting event. And I can foresee and I think of a, a number of uh, uh, institutions where they might have signage up in the gym yeah. for the whole winter season, yeah. Yeah. Totally. something like that. So I would hope we would have a, a less restrictive policy in that section, okay. uh, at least as an option. Um, can, I, can I stop the conversation just for a second? Um, I appreciate both comments so far, but I, I just want to pause for a second. People have concerns, but it doesn't necessarily mean that they're the concerns of the entire committee. 
and I'm not exactly sure how to get a hold of yeah. that. Yeah. Uh, Rob, I respect your concerns. Michael, I respect yours, but they're yours, right. and they're not necessarily those of the entire community. And I don't know how to how to conduct that conversation so that I can take back to the subcommittee mm -hmm. members who are here. Um, <laughs> How, you know how to how to respond to those within the context of the policy I just don't know so I would like if it's possible without going on till midnight hear people's responses to Michael and Rob's concerns um, just to get a better feel for how deep that is does that make sense well I'm, I will I would think you can take it back and it's not a first read yet so we have an opportunity as a committee to discuss it at least three times well I'd like to hear from some other folks Debbie uh, so I just would like to say I agree with Rob. I mean, if, if we have a sponsor that wants to put a banner up in the gym for all of basketball season, I, I think that's appropriate, and we shouldn't be restricting it through the policy. Anybody else? Catherine? Yeah, I, I also agree. Um, I thought that was a little restrictive, because I, I imagine that banners would be up for a season at least, maybe for the school year, I don't know. And I also agree um, with Rob's point about local versus um, even, you know, northeast businesses, because I do know that Big Y, for example, and Stop and Shop, our local Stop and Shop, are very generous, and I would not want to, you know, say, no, you can't have a banner, um, because you're not, mm -hmm. local, you know, considered. So, and, and, you know, that's something I would like the policy to consider is how how are those decisions made? Um, and, and I agree that I don't want to impose my own personal feeling um, and sp on that necessarily. My, my own opinion on this is that we should always be, we should be thinking like everything else about the kids mm -hmm. and the money is going to do good for the kids. So I'm in favor of getting as much money as possible any way we can. And so I would bend on the commercial aspects of things to get more money. So I think local is great, but it doesn't preclude getting bigger bucks from national companies. And you don't have to take, you can turn down any ads you want to turn down. And I would put as many fence ads up as you could plaster the place with to get more money. So <laughs> that's my opinion. That's a good thing. <coughs> I think um, I, I'm, I'm more comfortable myself um, having it all on the website because it's a structure that's already set up with advertisement, and so it's something that we're used to, but we could have control over that. And I'm against the idea of having stuff up in the gym because, I mean, I understand the need for it, and, and I like to work on something to make it happen. Um, but it's when you talk about the whole child and the whole person and with that branding loyalty and um, setting them up to always be seeing this all the time where they can't walk away from the screen um, makes me a little hesitant, so. Okay, Michael. If no one else wants to talk, I just have, I'll just throw out a couple other ones, if that's all right. Um, there's, in the section about advertising by nonprofit organizations, mm -hmm. one, it seems like you would want to include government community groups that are not necessarily nonprofits. I'm sorry, what? what? It's advertising by nonprofit right, organizations. Right, I, I missed who we should. It says only for nonprofit organizations and as opposed to businesses, but there's the other categories that are non-business would be government or non-incorporated community groups who might want to advertise stuff. So, mm -hmm. um, And that section just seems a little bit more constrictive, oddly, than the business one. Mm -hmm. um, it seems like nonprofits are actually they're charitable organizations by definition, so why would you be more restrictive than not? Um, I would move the definition of advertising to the beginning, because I think that's sort of where it should live. Um, and there's one place, I think the two other things I've just seen, and I'll email you the rest, is it, it needs a little bit tighter definition about things, like it talks about philanthropic at the very, very beginning, without hampering philanthropic efforts, and that the school committee requires that any advertising benefit the school district. So I would have a distinctly different definition than Rick in terms of what benefits. Mm -hmm. So we need to have some parameters. Some of the stuff that I saw is that actually building in some review process um, that right now we're at the school committee either can choose or not to give it to the superintendent, but actually just like we have, you know, the dip and the sip and everyone, there's committees, not to make it overly bureaucratic, but you can build in different perspectives mm -hmm. and actually have a process so it's not based on one other. And I think the only other thing I would say 
just now is that there's somewhere in here where it talks about the school committee giving the authority to the superintendent to make the decision, but there's nothing about saying that the school committee can pull it back. So it might be that in day-to-day -day operations for decision-making, the superintendent or mm -hmm. this review committee can make the decision, but it might be a big thing <coughs> where we want to have the ability as a school committee to say, this is our decision, and so building that into the process where it reaches a bar or there's some reason why it would be retained. Okay, so maybe to, to Michael's point, and I had a hard time kind of understanding how the process would work based on this policy, who would actually be approving individual ads or sponsors. Um, but it does say specifically in here, the school committee reserves the right to reject or refuse placement or to require removal of any or all commercial messages or advertisements that do not comply. It says something different later on. Oh, see, well, that, and I think I, I'm a little confused. I, I did find that confusing. It kind of went back and forth on back, and, and I thought maybe it could be a little clearer laying out, you know, what that process is. Mark? So, like, like with a lot of things, it doesn't strike me as the purview of the school committee to be talking about should that be in a mauve or a yellow <laughs> or <laughs> low, right? That's just, that's just not what you're here for, right? So what I would recommend is that the decision making reside at the school level. We are the superintendent's designee, right? What we receive from you is a set of parameters, right? And we can be called here to defend our decisions, but like you rely on us to pick the, bo pick the books, hire the teachers, build the master schedule, right? I think this, this sits on that plane of decision making. You set the broad parameters and you charge us to go execute it. So I would, I would rec recommend that you folks stay out of that line of work. Actually, it does speak to the superintendent has to create guidelines. Exactly. And so just like other things where there's, there's going to be district yes. guidelines, that yes. regardless of who's making the decision, superintendent yes. or the principals, that they would have to go, go here. Yes. Um, That's my point, right? Yeah. You, Absolutely. You, you give us the structure. And then I create the guidelines that, yes. That we approve. Yes, we work them. with them. Mm -hmm. Okay, anything else? All right. Thanks a lot, Mark and Rich. Thank you. <coughs> um, Rich, can you be here at the 22nd? Yeah. Because we'll try to come back with this in the 22nd. If we don't, I'll let you know. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. The committee for doing all this work. Yeah, that was a lot of work. Get some rest. Yeah, let's see. So looking at the calendar, <coughs> next meeting, next meeting we've got later start vote. Um, we've got a discipline update, discipline report. Um, we've got we're going to start discussing district report card, uh, which is one of the things we're going to be discussing at the retreat. So let me jump ahead to that. The retreat on June 26. We're going to be. Well, I want your input, but uh, Catherine, Debbie, and myself and Maria have been talking about what m might be on the agenda, and we have three things. One is a report card. You know, what can we look at that tells us whether the district is improving or not improving? And what are all the measurements that would go on to that report card? So you can start thinking about that now, and we'll discuss that at a meeting before the retreat to start getting ideas for that. So that's one thing, report card. Um, the next thing is how do we, how do we uh, make our goals? We haven't, we've kind of struggled with that in the past where, and we've struggled with the difference between school committee goals, district goals, superintendent goals, and what are the goals that we're evaluating the superintendent on? Mm -hmm. And it's kind of been a mess for the last year or two. Um, now, three years ago, there was apparently a committee, there was a committee for this, and they went away with a superintendent and worked on the goals and came back, and I'm told it worked a lot better. Um, so I, we're thinking of maybe we'll discuss that at the next meeting too, or at the 612 meeting about reestablishing that committee to talk about doing goals. Now, I had wanted to do goals before the end of June because the idea was we do the goals at the end of the spring so that they sort of feed into the district improvement plan that comes out going into September. but. We're gonna, since we're going to be talking about that at the retreat, which is our last meeting before the July break, um, I think we're going to learn so much about how to do that that I think we've got to postpone mm -hmm. the actual goal creation until first or second or both meetings of August. Mm -hmm. um, 
but if we form this committee, they can be working on this during the summer, perhaps even before the not not before the retreat, but right after the retreat, retreat they get going on that. Um, and then the third thing was just uh, simply discussing, you know, the responsibility of the school committee versus superintendent. So mm -hmm. like, what what is covered under policy? What is covered under budget? And things like that. I think Glenn Kuchar is going to be here to facilitate that whole process. And as a sort of a fourth thing, yeah. probably at the end, is um, he'll start to talk about his governance project that he's doing with districts, and we're one of the districts in this governance project, which is all about all of this stuff. So that'll be exciting to hear about how that's going to happen. I think we'll learn more about how we can govern ourselves better. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. What was that again? Four, four to six. six. Oh, okay. So there's a. They're gonna be here four to six for an orientation. Uh, orientation for anybody who hasn't had one on how to be on a school committee. On the twenty sixth. So that's four to six on June twenty sixth, and then the retreat will start at six and end at nine. Okay. How long do you have to have been on the committee to not go to that meeting? Uh, you yeah. have to have had one. If you've never. You had oh, a whole, okay. You have a whole oh. year. Yeah, it's it's okay. ideal if you can. Okay, but but we haven't, and we'll figure out the location and such of where we're going to do this. So we'll, we'll let you guys know. Any input? Yeah. Deb. Oh, I have a different question. Oh, so if you yep. Yeah, I just want to make sure somewhere in here, class size gets yeah. talked about. Okay. Yeah. The, oh, I'm sorry. I, I put it tentatively on five twenty-two. If we want to think about it then, or on the six twelve. Sorry, I got distracted on the retreat and yeah. didn't finish the calendar. <laughs> That's right for you. So, yeah, district report card on 522 and then class size on 522, or maybe that will jump to 612. I haven't received many, but I have received some emails from people who, this is a pretty important issue. Um, okay. It would be nice to at least begin talking of about course. it this year. Absolutely. Rather than the fall. Sure. Not a problem. And then on 612, an equity report update. Um, a partnership presentation. Could you tell us about what that? Sure. I'm, I'm asking. I was going to ask lots of partners to come, but I've kind of narrowed it to um, the three UMass professors who work closely with us around um, improving instruction in the schools. So Rebecca Woodland, um, Sarah Whitcomb, and um, Laura Valdivieso will come, and they're going to talk about their work related to equity and ELL um, work within our schools, um, the positive behavioral support. So the behavioral part of the triangle of the tiered instruction, and then Rebecca's work around um, instruction in general and um, creating the conditions for teachers to improve instruction. So they'll be coming to talk about their collective work with us. Anything missing? Anything you'd like to see on agendas? Yes. Yeah, I don't know if it's appropriate for the regional or the Amherst, but I would actually be interested in getting a report uh, on the program, the move, the aim. AIM program, if you could give us a report sure. on what the... No, I was going to ask about the... That, that's yeah. Amherst. That's Amherst. Yeah, that's what I figured. Yeah. Yeah. I can yeah. update you at the Amherst meeting on the 15th, but I can also send you something in advance. That would be great. Yeah, Thank you. not a problem. Debbie. Can I just ask a logistical question about the 15th? Because the 15th will be a joint Amherst-Pelham Union meeting. Yes. So from an agenda standpoint, mm -hmm. do... Do we just have one agenda that is also posted at Pelham? How does that work? That's, that's what we traditionally okay, do. So, um, so if you, I assume it's joint simply so that you can have the math report. And an executive session. And for the executive session. So unless you want input into the agenda, no. Ms. Oppie and uh, Ms. Garrett can set it, that's and fine. then I'll be happy to make sure it's posted in all of the towns. Perfect. Thank you. Well, again, this is, I'm sorry, this is Amherst Pelham then, but since we're here, does it make sense to let Union and Pelham go and continue with just Amherst business at some point, or do we not have enough Amherst-only business to make that make sense? Um, we just, may let them go at some point if we're going, but we'll have to see if we're going to do the executive session then before the meeting. But we can, yeah, we'll, yeah. we can, That'd yeah, that was nice of you, <laughs> <laughs> No, we can, we can definitely do, figure out that. When we look at the agenda, although if we're going to just if we're going to discuss um, again the impact of the um, late start on elementary mm -hmm. schools, yeah, you know, that's certainly so that a might be a, discussion. As but well. then when we go to like the Ames right. program and yeah, such yeah, like right. that, then we can right, go right, back right. and be. Yeah. We can do this. If, if you want to let Union go early, make sure to do the executive session at the beginning yep. of the meeting. Yeah. 
Anything else? Okay, I'll take a motion to adjourn. I move to adjourn. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Okay, great. Thank you, everyone. Thank you Thank all. You.